Hello and welcome to Unit 5 of Epidemiology Essentials. In this last unit of the module, we'll be looking at depiction of epidemiologic data. Calculating proportions or rates of a disease or risk factor is an important part of practical public health work. Identifying appropriate and interesting methods of depicting these data is critical for disseminating this information to a target audience. We will explore the tool of data visualization, understand basic components of effective visualizations, and walk through practical exercises of identifying strengths and weaknesses of specific visualizations towards meeting their stated goals. Understanding the components of effective data visualizations, we have to find visualizations put forth by widely recognized public health agencies and how to create a visualization using publicly available data will be helpful tools you will need as you lead public health efforts in your community. Data visualization is the presentation of data in pictorial or graphical format. In fact, it may actually be interactive, allowing the user to change different inputs and view the resulting patterns or trends. As computer technology has improved, data visualization has been brought to the forefront of corporate work and, more recently, public health practice. Large amounts of complex data can be much better understood using visualizations as opposed to charts and tables. As the old adage goes, a picture is worth a thousand words. One of the earliest examples of data visualization actually comes from approximately the year 1812 when Charles Minard a civil engineer created a map showing the movement of Napoleon's army into and out of Russia. While maps were very commonly used at this time, this map was unique in that it showed not only the army's path, but also included numbers of soldiers, temperature, as well as time. We can readily appreciate how useful this early example of data visualization might have been. What does this data visualization do for us? It allows individuals to comprehend information quickly and easily. You can imagine it is much easier to digest information from a figure than it might be from a complex table. It shows patterns, relationships, and trends. It allows identification of newly emerging changes, hotspots, or outliers. It allows prediction of future events through extrapolation, but not necessarily through modeling. And it communicates a story or a message. The various types of data visualization include charts, graphs, maps, infographics, dashboards, and storyboards. There are important steps you want to undertake before thinking about creating your data visualization. First of all, it is imperative that you understand your data. You cannot convey messages if you don't know what your data is showing. Then, you must decide on the message or story that you would like to communicate. And certainly this has to be tailored to your target audience. Consider logistical details. Should the map be interactive? Do individuals have the opportunity to impute certain parameters of interest? What is the computing access and computing power of your target audience? Is the internet speed conducive to viewing an interactive visualization? How current or updated can you keep your visualization? Displaying a visualization with data from several years ago is not helpful. Most importantly, learn from others. There are numerous blogs, books, articles, and examples that can be found on the internet and other sources. Certainly, you will be able to see what works and what doesn't work for you. Once you do that, taking the time and learning how to create a data visualization can be an incredibly powerful method for conveying public health information. That brings us to the use of graphs in public health. Graphs are one of the most widely used forms of data visualization in public health and epidemiology. Why do we use graphs? These display data in visual form. They allow us to highlight patterns and differences that are harder to discern when presented as a list or a table. 
they are an effective way to communicate with a wide variety of audiences. As public health practitioners, we have a responsibility to convey data in a way that is accessible to our large target audience, but also in a way that is not biased or misleading. Therefore, consider the following best practices in creating a graph. Every line or shape should have purpose. Everything on your graph should convey something. Ensure that labels and titles are all clear and self-explanatory. All symbols and abbreviations should be defined. Consider your message and make an effort to convey, convey this message in a straightforward and objective manner. And decisions made in the type or style of graph can fundamentally change the story that, are con that is conveyed by the graph or figure. Important components of a graph are the title that clearly delineates the data being depicted, the axis titles letting the audience know what is being shown on each of the axes, a legend that describes the different components that are depicted on the, gra on the graph if necessary, a data source, if not indicated in the title or in the legend, this must be placed in a separate text box. Essentially, the graph should be able to stand alone. If pulled away from your manuscript or your report, someone should know what the graph is, where the data comes from, and what the story is that you are trying to tell. Here we see an example of a, gra of a graph and the US state and local public health laboratories reporting to the CDC the number of specimens tested and percent positive for the SARS-CoV-2 virus with periods of March 1st, 2020 to August 2nd, 2020. Another example of a graphical representation, estimated job lost across the US. So these are different types of graphs. Different types of graphs can highlight different points or trends in your data. Compare the two graphs depicted here and think about the differences in the message that are conveyed by each. The line graph at the top and the bar graph at the bottom. Keep in mind, however, that certain types of graphs may not be appropriate for certain types of data. Is it appropriate to connect the dots across the different series in a line graph, for example? The bar graph is an excellent way to provide comparisons within each of the series in each point across time, whatever it is that the x-axis is depicting. The line graph, in contrast, is an excellent way of showing how the data connects across the x-axis depictions. If the depictions on the x-axis are different points in time, it may be very appropriate to connect the different points and show that as a trend. However, if they represent discrete things such as, say, health disciplines, it may not be appropriate to connect them because the space in between the depictions has no meaning. Many graphs use dual axes. What do we mean by dual axis? Take a look at the example provided here. On the left side, y-axis, you can see data depicted in thousands. This is, in this graph, a depiction of number of specimens tested. On the right side is the second y-axis. Here you see the positivity rates, and that is displayed by the various lines across the bar graph. Why might one use a dual axis? And in what cases is using a dual axis appropriate? A dual axis is a useful way to depict two very different types of data. For example, if you have opposite trend directions, or as in this case, very different scales, you can see the y-axis on the left is in the thousands, while the y-axis on the right is in single and low double digit numbers. It would not be possible to even see the lines if we try to show them on the same axis as the bars that are displayed on the left side y-axis. A slightly more nuanced or perhaps more difficult choice is the choice of scale. One can use a linear scale or a logarithmic scale on the axis. As a reminder, a linear scale depicts exact counts or rates. In this case, in the graphs on the left, linear scale depicts a number being conveyed that goes between approximately zero and tens of thousands. You can depict the same information on a logarithmic scale which depicts counts or rates on an exponential scale. Without thinking about what these graphs are talking about, think about what message is being conveyed in each of these graphs. 
if there is, in fact, a constant rate of increase in COVID-19 morbidity and mortality, which scale more accurately be depicts that? Using the linear scale would potentially even induce panic or worry in someone that might think there's a sudden and striking increment in COVID-19 cases and deaths in the latter months on these graphs. In contrast, the logarithmic scale depicts a much more constant and steady rate of increase. Color selection and pattern selection must be carefully done. One important question is, are the chosen colors easy to differentiate and are they easy to see? Take a look at this graph here. The difference in the violet between the US and the Norway, and Norway might actually be difficult for some people to discern. For some computer monitors and some individuals, the yellow for Sweden might be very difficult to see. It's important to think about these things when selecting colors. Often, this means overriding the default of a computer program. Consider the setting in which your graph will be displayed, and therefore, how the graph actually looks in that arena. Most of us have experience where a graph looks one way on your computer, but completely different on the projector screen. In summary, data visualization is the presentation of data in pictorial or graphical format. Graphs are one of the most widely used forms of data visualization in public health and in epidemiology. Thus, decisions made in the type or style of graph can fundamentally change the story that is being conveyed by the graph or figure. So never forget, a picture is worth a thousand words. Now we'd like to introduce basic mapping of epidemiological data to stimulate our interest and we could go further to do more studies, more research, more reading into this with, with the available information out there. So maps and geographical information systems have become a cornerstone in public health and epi epidemiologic work in all communities. In this course, we'll discuss how place matters in public health and how understanding the geographic distribution of a disease or risk factor is an important component of designing appropriate interventions. The question is, does place matter? Why collect local information for health, disease, and wellness? Our environment has a significant influence on our health and well-being. We can utilize a wide in interpretation of what our environment is. It is comprised of the physical environment, the air, the ground, the water, the built environment, which are person-made structures that surround us, our behavioral and social environment, such as crime or poverty, food, beverage environment, such as healthy food access, and finally, our media environment, the advertisements that we are exposed to. As long as we recognize that geography influences illness and health, certain diseases occur at higher rates in some places and not in others. As far back as the founding of epidemiology as a discipline in the time of John Snow, a hand-drawn map pinpointed the source of a cholera, cholera epidemic. In his map, we could see the households in which cholera deaths occurred that are displayed in red dots that surround the blue dots, which represent water pumps in the city of London. For program planning, local health officials, health service delivery organizations, and health program planners all think about the physical layout of their target communities as an important aspect of program delivery. This helps ensure the targeted allocation of resources, given that these resources are often in limited supply. So how do we obtain geographic data? It might be collected in a study setting. It can also be created digitally, such as the case of satellite maps. There are also numerous publicly available sources of geographic data. For example, in the United States, the Census, the Environmental Protection Agency, and the local government provide this information. There are also geographic information system data portals. So what are we looking for in geographic data? We might ask, are events occurring closer together in one area versus another? That is, is there clustering of events? Does the risk of a disease vary across geographies? Are events of one type co-located with another? For example, do you see increased rates of prop property crime around neighborhoods with higher median income or does exposure in one area allow prediction of exposure in another where we might not have specific data? For example, air pollution data can be very difficult to obtain. 
Can we learn about air pollution exposure by looking at highway maps or roadway maps, for example? Ultimately, geographic information has become critical in numerous areas of population health as well as population service. For example, the po police departments routinely use maps for looking at where events occur. Health has now very much joined this trend and is also very much using maps and mapping and looking at how health and well-being are affected. It is a critical component of truly addressing health problems in communities. And this brings us to the concept of geographic information systems, GIS. GIS is a tool for integrating and visualizing spatial data from multiple sources. It is a visual database for spatial data that allows storage, manipulation, as well as display. What can we do with GIS? We can show where things occur. We can show how much of something occurs in one area versus another. And we can show changes over time as well as place. Let's look at an example here of a map. This map depicts wildfire hazard potential in 2020 across the United States. The map clearly shows the scale, the direction, and a large amount of data in one depiction. The legend shows the areas of very low wildfire hazard potential that are in the darker green, all the way to areas of very high wildfire hazard potential in the brighter red. GIS is a generic name for a tool or software. There are numerous examples. Proprietary options for which a license is required are things like ArcGIS or GeoMedia. There are also numerous free software like QGIS or Joda, which are commonly used.